Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for your patience. We just uh, needed a couple of moments to get fully set up. Uh, a warm welcome to you all, as if the weather isn't warm enough. Uh, it's a delight to have uh, Professor Ewan Burney as our speaker today. Ewan is, of course, uh, known to most of us. He's an international shining light in bioinformatics, but also very valued local uh, collaborator and colleague, and as well as director of the European Bioinformatics Institute. Uh, Ewan has specifically asked to speak at this forum. I think Ewan and his collaborators working on this exciting uh, electronic health record project are seeking uh, input, uh, questions, comments from uh, a health data, broad health data science audience. So I'll hand over to Ewan uh, to give us a talk and just to remind everyone that uh, please uh, keep your questions coming using the chat function. We'll batch them at the end, and uh, and there'll be plenty of time for Q and A with with you. And so you and you're very welcome. Great, thank you. And um, John, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, please go yeah, ahead. Perfect. Okay. So now, um, here we go, and hopefully that's good for everybody to see. Um, John, give me a verbal yes, that I'm not screwing that up. Good, really clear. Okay. All right, so um, John gave uh, gave that, that input. I, I have to admit, um, I don't want to either oversell or undersell this. Um, so this is very much a, a, a work in progress, but as you'll see, um, I think it's, uh, it's gone through a tipping point, and I think it was, it's going to stimulate things that happen both in the HDR Cambridge world, and I know that there's lots of similar great work that happens across the UK in the broader HDR ecosystem, and I would like this to add to the kind of confidence uh, that this kind of ecosystem is, can flourish and deliver interesting results. The final thing is this is actually the first time I have ever led a health data thing. I actually need very practical advice about um, where to publish uh, or where to submit, where to think about submission in three to six months time. The next important thing is I'm really, I'm a bit of a charlatan here because I'm really presenting the work of uh, Maria Herrero and uh, Victoria Keevil. Maria is a postdoc in my group and Victoria is a clinician a uh, clinician scientist who has just got an MRC fellowship and is also for that MRC fellowship um, attached to my group. We discussed about who should present and um, uh, I suggested myself just to be clear and, and we all agreed, um, uh, just to be clear the, the work is from Maria and Victoria and they are on uh, this uh, chat here um, or this uh, this uh, seminar here, and may I may well ask them to answer some questions if they come up. So the next thing um, to mention what we're looking at, uh, we're looking at a, a population of uh, older adults um, admitted as emergency uh, people, as uh, so non-elective admissions to Addenbrookes, um, and you can see the dates here. It's an interesting question um, about precisely why we selected that, um, but one key thing is just simple numbers. This is a population where you can get quite a large number of people. And these were the research questions we put in. Um, and just to say we went through the appropriate um, uh, regulation for this. This is actually routinely collected healthcare data so we use the, the, the provisions for routine um, uh, healthcare data collection. And um, we also went through our own uh, internal ethics system from EMBOL for this, which is called BIAC, uh, for example. Yeah. So just to give you a sense of um, uh, our data set, um, we start off with 61,000 unique patients. Um, we uh, filter that down ultimately to 43 um, uh, admission episodes, which are also, we're looking at the first admission episode recorded for that patient in each of these cases. 
Um, and you can see that we are focusing here on uh, patients that have lab tests and vital signs. And I should say this is all enabled due to the electronic healthcare records um, in Addenbrooke's hospital, the EPIC system. And so there is a huge amount, I, everything now is electronic is my understanding. Um, and therefore uh, all of this data is being collected as a, as a routine part of their um, healthcare delivery. Um, you can see that we, we made uh, um, a lot of the drama in doing this, as many of you will know, will be um, about uh, imputation, so data quality, but also data presence, basically, followed by imputation. And I'm going to step you through some of the imputation because that's where a lot of the drama is. So just to step you through the things that we actually recorded, there are things about demographics, there are things about out outcomes, there's things about laboratory test results, about vital signs, and others, and uh, for example, these uh, things used in geriatric medicine, frailty scores, and the early warning school score scales, which can limp back to uh, clinical practice. Most of the, what we're gonna show in terms of modeling is about laboratory test results and vital signs. So I just want to emphasize how important this upfront process is. Probably 50 to 80% of the time is going to be spent on getting the data set, cleaning it, normalizing it, and then doing missing data imputation. There's an awful lot of choices in this, and uh, these choices are developed by Maria, um, but with a lot of chat between Maria, myself, Tom Fitzgerald, who's also been part of this project, and Victoria. So just to step through some of the key um, decisions, after some level of data cleaning and, and sorting out some, so just some, some fields that just does, don't make sense. We go through a data normalization. We use this inverse rank transformation. That's where you take your values, you rank them, and then you project them back onto a Gaussian. And this has a number of nice features. It, it reduces the impact of outliers. It obviously, you sacrifice some power if those outliers were really real. Um, but it, in general, it's better to, to, to lose some power there. But the second thing is it enforces normal distributions of the data, which is great for the next couple of steps in this. And so then we um, uh, regularize this data over the uh, hospital episodes. So in fact, we decided, and there's, again, it's, a, it's quite a long debate that you can have here to create bins uh, every, um, uh, think about this as a measurement per day. We have a minimum length of stay of three or more days. Uh, we take the first, when there's more than one lab test in a day, we take the first one, that's somewhat arbitrary. And then we take the vital sign measurement closest to the lab tests that we measure. But we still, after all of this, and many of the people on this, pre, uh, on this uh, Zoom call will know, uh, we have many cases where we don't have observations. So imputation is a really important process here and Maria explored a variety of ways of doing the imputation. We came up with quite a complicated scheme. So this is after the, the regularization. We then look at, at days where we have the majority, we have a large amount of information and in those days, we use a multiple imputation method to fill in the missing, you know, a particular lab test didn't come back for that individual on that day. We fill in that one using this multiple imputation method. And then for the days where we have either no or more commonly very poor information days, we use linear interpolation between our information rich days for that to get a final regularized and imputed data set. We keep track of which values we've imputed. Um, uh, so we know at the end of the day, uh, which things we've imputed and which things we, uh, we have directly measured. I just want to step you through some of the kind of diagnostic plots and other plots here that Maria used. Some of you will know these different imputation methods. So this is predictive mean matching. In some ways, this is simply saying to to predict 
um, uh, a, uh, some missing data, I find some individuals that I think fit the individual that I'm trying to predict, I find a variety of them and then I take the, uh, the, the mean or, or um, you, I take the individual that most looks like the individual that I've got to impute. So here are some correlations both uh, of where missingness lies and the correlation patterns of missingness. And this shouldn't surprise you. You can see basically the structure of the different tests that are being ordered for patients and the correlation of the values of the variables um, uh, when present. And the right hand side is um, the final set of predictors used for each, um, uh, for each value, which, which other things do we use as predictors, which you notice includes demographics and other things. I think there can be a tremendous habit in thinking that, that this, these, these missingness patterns are obviously due to clinical practice, and there's clearly information embedded in the missing, missingness patterns. Um, we haven't exploited that information, in my view, I mean, that's almost a separate project to think about how to exploit that information. I just want to recognize that there is that information um, and then recognize that we're not actually using it. We're just trying to get over the problem of, uh, of missing data. And then this is the second stage of um, uh, imputation. This is uh, for the different types of, um, again, the different measurements on the left hand side and here you can see a chart of when do we uh, actually have the original data and you can see on the right hand side in the yellow um, uh, that the vital signs data are, are least missingness and then the different types of imputation that's used either the multiple imputation method um, uh, or the linear interpolation. You can see quite a bit has to be linearly interpolated um, and that is because there are some days which, are, which really the patient really doesn't get measured at all. So I just want to emphasize, I've just skipped over a good nine months of Maria um, doing hand-to-hand -hand combat, trying different methods, deciding, looking at the outputs and, and everything else uh, of the different imputation. And we end up with a series of admission episodes one admission episode per patient. And this is now looking at the, that final distribution. It's a distribution in length of days here, where you can see the bulk of the patients have three days. Remember, we didn't deal with, we excluded people who had less than three days admission episodes. And we've got a long tail that goes out. And on the right-hand side, you can see some of the statistics for this. Uh, females, inpatient mortality, uh, post-discharge mortality admission. At this point, we've set aside 20% of our data set. So uh, in fact, that's outside of this 8,000 number. So 20% of our patients, we, we have now, post imputation, we have no longer looked at 20% of our patients and we will continue not to look at them until we've finally got to the point where we want to uh, validate some of the methods. So um, we discussed a variety of ways of modeling this and and uh, we decided to try this 1960s approach called hidden Markov models. To be brutally honest, that's based because both myself and Tom are extremely familiar with hidden Markov models. So we know our way around these things quite well. It is not the only way, I'll come back to that. The other thing which I think it can easily be um, forgotten is that really in machine learning, you have these two different types of models, discriminative models, where you pose a question to the machine learning scheme and you, you see how well you can answer that question using the data. Will this patient die in hospital or not, for example? And then the other way, which is a generative model, where you just ask uh, the model to, to organize it in some way. So in this case, it's by this expectation maximization of the parameters. So finding parameters to this hidden Markov model that will uh, maximize the likelihood of seeing the data that you present, it, present to it. There's, in some sense, from that perspective, uh, we have only one parameter, which is the number of states used in the Markov model. 
And after some exploration of the different state numbers, we settled on 17. That's a very arbitrary number. It, will, it works sort of fine at 10 and fine at 20. Um, and I'm not too overly worried about that. What's in particularly important is there is no other information except for lab tests and vital signs presented to the hidden Markov model. So I'm going to come on to a moment where we take states of the hidden Markov model and we look at, for example, whether uh, a patient died during the, the uh, an in, uh, inpatient um, deaths um, or different ICD-10 codes that is not used in the training um, of the hidden Markov model. So um, what, I, what I'm going to do show now is, um, you know, the states that are numbered from 0 to 17, um, or rather 0 to 16 uh, in this. Um, and just to keep your, the, the visualization of these states um, uh, consistent, um, we have colored them by the amount of time um, the, the proportion that state is uh, in patients who either have inpatient death uh, um, uh, or were discharged alive. And you can see here that 13, state 13, it's, it's an arbitrary, obviously, state label, is the state associated the most with death in the hospital. And state 12 is the state associated the least. Um, uh, with um, with death and the most with therefore being discharged alive. Um, so we have um, uh, now I'm showing a visualization here of all the patients in the data set. You can see we and now uh, are colored by the state label uh, where zero is their first day here and then it spreads out going to the right and we've sorted them by length of stay. So I should say rather we split it into the patients that died in the hospital in the top and the patients who, who were discharged alive. Um, and then we've so, uh, sorted them by their length of stay. You can immediately see the same thing that I just showed you in, this, in the previous plot, which is that we see a preponderance of states, uh, uh, darker states at the top and lighter states at the bottom. And we can also see that the lighter states get lighter closer to the end, which kind of makes sense as well. There's a, a different way of visualizing this where we center on the middle day and just to kind of zoom in to get away from these very long tails. Um, uh, this is now a picture of, uh, again, um, all the people within who had 21 or less days in hospital. And again, you can see the shift between the darker states on the left and the lighter states on the right. I'm going to now show you a number of plots that look like this. This is one particular state, state number seven. And the first thing is uh, showing you the same plot, but we're now only coloring this particular state. And for state seven, rather, uh, you know, there's nothing in the training data set that makes the first day special, but the hidden Markov model uh, expectation maximization uh, wanted to spend a lot of time modeling in state seven the very first day. So the first day is different from the hidden Markov model's perspective than pretty much all the other days. And you can see that first day is actually similarly modeled between people who end up dying and people who are discharged alive. Just to show later on, we're going to go through more of these um, uh, plots, but this is just to get some sense of what's driving that state. So this is looking at the distribution of the lab tests and vital signs for that hidden Markov model state seven. Because we've done inverse normalization, the zero here really means effectively the mean across our entire population. And the inverse normalization also guarantees that the variance uh, of all of these tests, at least post that normalization, is the same. And then there's going to be a little bit of drift because of imputations and some other things. But generally, it's, it's uh, the, the width of the variance will, will, because of the normalization, be the same. So here you can see for this particular day of admission, this is notes from Victoria here, that the white blood cells are up, in particular neutrophils. 
and she feels that there's two different things going on here. One is it's either an infective process and or at the same time an acute thrombotic event and noticing in particular the elevated hemoglobin and hemocrit uh, stages. An additional plot we look at, so that you've seen on the, on the right hand side are the two plots I've just shown you for state seven. So the right hand side is nothing new. On the left hand side is sort of the same as the, the middle plot, but now not splitting by discharge versus deceased, but rather splitting by the ICD-10 codes of the primary diagnosis. And we just put the, the, the starting chapter there which goes, if you know your ICD-10s, A through to probably X or something, but we've listed it up, uh, the, the, the ones which are uh, in our data sets. And you can see that for state seven, it's actually spread over all the different ICD-10 codes for primary diagnosis. Now, Victoria has had, I think, with Maria, had great fun going through these states. And I've encouraged her to give a name for each state you shouldn't overread this name and you shouldn't you know these things are are modeling um um uh, aspects however there are well, i'll step you through some of these states are very distinct and therefore interesting and we'll go through a number of these cases the hmm is obviously trying to model everything that's going on and uh, victoria thinks of them in these three different big buckets a sort of disease associated states, a physiologically associated states, and then some sort of admission stage uh, states as well, including that state seven, which was the acute presentation state. So this is a state, state number 11, um, which is uh, associated pretty specifically with hepatic function and therefore with the ICD codes C, which includes the hepatic cancers, and K, the diseases of the digestive system and you can see that it's not tremendously for, um, uh, associated with whether you are discharged or die in hospital and the right hand side here shows this incredibly striking uh, um, uh, increase in in um, uh, these three different uh, lab tests associated with liver function so that's uh, is why victoria called this the hepatic state this is a different state so I just want to flip hepatic state, just look at C, it stops becoming red, go to N, it starts becoming red. Um, there is a p-value associated with that as well, but, but to get that visual flip, you can, you can imagine that it's pretty good. Um, and you can see here that this um, Victoria has labeled as a stable renal state. It's associated with N and I in ICD codes, mainly N. Um, uh, and not necessarily associated with discharge status. And again, the vital signs shown on the right. This is a, a, another state which is also associated with the ICD-10 code, but is um, all, uh, in addition is associated with inpatient death. And you can see here that there's a, a much stronger um, aspect of this um, uh, state uh, at the top there, this is state 13, and thus Victoria has described this as unstable renal state. So I just want to go through Victoria's notes. Again, this is, we're still, as we'll come on to a moment, we're still in the rather fun thing of, of really trying to understand this data. And I, we would love to get feedback um, on some of these things. Um, uh, but you can see that some of these feel quite um, well defined and some of them have these uh, much more loose definitions, treatment response state one, treatment response state two, for example. So what happens next? So um, the, the team with Maria, um, uh, Victoria, myself and Tom, we are going to plan to dream up and test some hypotheses um, and maybe ask uh, those, whether we can answer some of those hypotheses on the same data set um, uh, uh, using discriminative training. We're going to be good scientists and use this pre-registration at this point of hypotheses, so we're forcing ourselves to describe in a document the work we've done so far, 
and then describe the hypotheses that we will now test. Um, and that's all about this reproducible science uh, process. We're going to continue to hold out 20% until right to the end um, uh, in this process as well. Um, hidden Markov models are not the only machine learning technique, and I appreciate that many people on this call will probably roll their eyes at, at Hidden Markov models. And uh, we're certainly going to be using some trendier, more recent um, techniques. So we've got our eyes on random forests, uh, in particular for the discriminative training, using the first couple of days, probably specifically day two, because day two is, I think, a more discriminative day than day one, and that's maybe one of the hypotheses that we'll put in. Uh, we'd love advice about other things, uh, long short-term uh, memory neural networks, again, called our eyes, but if somebody knows a, a better way <laughs> or a different way to do it, we appreciate um, uh, input. And then, as I mentioned, I do feel that this is coming together at this point better than I had um, anticipated, if I'm honest. Maybe this is expected. Um, and so we'd quite like any advice about where to publish. I'm quite keen to stay away from trying to make strong clinical practice statements from this because I'd quite like to focus the paper on we can get the data, we can normalize, we can impute, and we can derive interesting biological information from it. And here are, here's a, a kind of a, the rich way we can describe this data and leave changes on, you know, more directed clinical um, uh, questions um, for a later t um, uh, um, uh, study and paper. And that goes to the right hand side here. Um, so longer term, for me, this validates the use of um, routinely collected data. Um, and I'd really like to advocate for more detailed ongoing data collection with consent. Um, uh, and the consent will allow us, I think, to um, think about measuring things that you don't normally measure in the hospital, perhaps using spare blood. So two things spring to mind. Uh, genomics, genotyping, if, if we had genotyped these individuals, I think it would be, we would have some immediate things to be able to do association studies on. Um, and I also think that there's a lot of other blood measurements that one can think about doing, um, maybe banking the blood and then, uh, and then um, uh, selecting subsets in the future, or maybe just doing it as an additional kind of research study. So metabolomics and proteomics. And again, I'd like to focus here on day one, uh, sorry, day two and day three as particularly important days. Um, I know that other hospitals have lab results, uh, particular um, UCLH, I should have put the H there, has EPIC. And I think we'd be really, really, if there's anybody from UCLH here, this would be, I think, an interesting thing in the longer term to link up between hospitals. There's obvious questions about generalization that people will ask. And then the other thing, and this goes to an HDR UK kind of perspective, I am keen to see this really quite complicated effort in, in data normalization imputation be made available to a broader set of researchers. So I would be very comfortable with the idea of a safe haven to have data, a sort of data publication in a responsible, safe way. Now, this is, I think this is interesting. Um, a, one needs to think about the safe haven and the location for that. One also needs to think about the ethics and the, um, the questions and, and other things that one can state. So it may well be that, sadly, this data set by itself, because we haven't gone through the right processes to have a kind of safe haven output, is not the right data set. But I do feel that we should be pushing for this kind of manipulated, cleaned, manipulated, imputed data sets being, um, and anonymized, of course, uh, um, being made as accessible as we can, consistent with the ethics and the principles that we have for, for um, uh, health data. So summary, we've taken, we've shown we can take an epic data set from Cambridge University hospitals and derive informative features by large scale data science on patient biology. I don't want to make too many claims on, on clinical work, but obviously some of the ICD-10 codes get you to, towards that aspect. 
And for me, the use of generative models with holdout clinical information and other demographics give us great confidence that the system's reporting biological and clinical structure. I just want to stress again, the, the hidden mark of model knows nothing of ICD-10 codes the, uh, and whether a patient dies or not in the hospital. This, of course, required a team science approach across Cambridge University Hospitals, University of Cambridge and Emberley BI. And um, I just want to list all the people who have contributed there. Um, so Victoria, who's been working um, and supported by John Bradley in the Cambridge University Hospitals. And just to mention that Victoria has just won a uh, Medical Research Council um, um, uh, fellowship. And then on the Embol EBI side, Maria has been funded also via the BRC process, uh, via Cambridge. So uh, as part of the, the Cambridge Biomedical Research Centre, she's been um, uh, in my group and working with myself and Tom uh, Fitzgerald. Final thing uh, to, to do, thank yous to two really key people. I don't know if they're on this call. So the first is Helen Street, who uh, was absolutely critical in navigating the um, data access ethics and um, uh, uh, the presentation and formulation of uh, this study. And then uh, Vince uh, Taylor, who's the clinical informatics integration lead and actually did the data extraction from Epic. And he is the person who has that ability to go to be both on the Epic side, do the anonymization, and then hand over to Maria the anonymized data set. We, we obviously don't want to see anything that is anywhere close to identifiable. So with that, I will thank you for listening. I hope that was sensible, and I guess I will stop sharing so I can see all of you on the video. Super, uh, fascinating you and, and uh, very stimulating. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. There are already uh, many logged in, and, and thank you also for giving us a lot of time for question and answers. Could I suggest that before we uh, open up to broader questions, uh, Ewan has uh, been emphatic about how this has been a team science effort and, and presenting this on behalf of key colleagues. I I'd call on uh, Maria and Victoria in particular to, uh, to make any comments before we, we open up and, and just to kind of prepare in case John Bradley would like to make some uh, brief comments afterwards. And I, I believe Vince Taylor's on the line and we have two Helens on the line. One could be Helen Street. I know the other is Helen Parkinson. So to have some of the key people to uh, who really made this happen, make some make some comments before we, we open it up to broader questions. So perhaps start with Victoria and Maria. Victoria, you're muted. <laughs> Oh, the challenges of technology. Um, it's a good job Ian was presented, otherwise it could have been a very silent presentation. Um, just to, to echo that there was a lot of work that went on to get to this point. So, um, and it really was collaborative. So working with Vince to make sure that we were getting the right data out of Epic involved quite a lot of um, painstaking checking of the data to make sure we had the right variables. And then obviously, the other really benefit thing to the collaboration is initially I didn't fully understand what the technical um, uh, necessities were going to be to make the data analyzable. And I think as you go through having that sort of technical clinical partnership really does mean that you, you learn a lot from each other about, about what you actually need to get the data to a point where you can look at it in a meaningful way. Um, and so, for me, it's been a sort of very enlightening process. Um, and it's really great to see that all this routinely collected data that is rich with information is actually being used um, because, you know, otherwise it's just sitting there and we're not learning from it. Um, so obviously we're still at quite a preliminary point um, in the uh, data interpretation process, but already we're seeing some very interesting signals. And for me as a clinician, I'm always very suspicious of um, complex statistical modeling, but actually um, having gone through the process and seeing these sort of very clear biological signals gives confidence that, that the uh, Markov model is clustering things in a way that I can recognize. But importantly, there are also things that I don't understand. And that's the interesting 
um, aspects to follow up because maybe we might be able to learn something new by following those sort of question marks. So that's sort of my understanding of the, of the process and interpretation of it thus far. I don't know if Maria wants to comment. Hi, yes, so I'm, I'm very happy of seeing this presented to the HDR UK. Uh, so yeah, it has been a lot of work, especially on the data processing um, and the data analysis, but at the same time quite so, because we started this in October 2018 with all the, the process to get the, the ethical approval and get the data transfer. It has been a, a, a collaborative work with Beans and with Helen, and it was also really enjoyable to, to have a, this diverse team. Uh, yeah, I think we are all very amazed by seeing these results. Um, also, as Victoria said, it's preliminary analysis, uh, but I think we are all very excited about all the questions open here and how to continue doing analysis to get uh, more answers. Splendid. Uh, John Bradley, uh, anything to add here? Uh, there, are, there are many ways, I think, in which this is a sort of landmark um, and Ewan's outlined quite a few of them. Just to emphasize that actually this was the first time we'd been able to transfer data out of CUH from EPIC at scale into an environment where it could actually be analyzed. And I think that was a really important first step. Um, we've now reproduced that uh, with another data set, as, as John knows, um, which relates more to, to COVID now sitting at the uh, High Performance Computing Centre in Cambridge. Um, and this does uh, involve remarkable teamwork to, to achieve these sorts of things. And uh, I think the only other thing to echo is uh, Ewan's point that having done this, um, we should work hard to make sure the data is accessible um, uh, and used because I think it really is a very unique data set. Vince Taylor, who uh, really has done a lot of the heavy lifting here with the data, has also uh, joined us and has been recognized. Vince, is there anything you would like to add here on the, the process side? Hi, uh, thank you for the invite. I feel quite emotional actually. It's not often I actually see uh, the data that I've extracted for people and uh, being presented. I don't often uh, get involved in that stage, so it's very exciting. Um, I think uh, the key for me has been the intense work that's gone on, gone into actually defining what is needed. Uh, the actual code, if you liked, for extracting it and transferring it is quite straightforward and quick. Uh, the key is that, uh, that tie in the three way conversation with Victoria and Maria to actually get stuff out that's, that's useful. So, so I think that we learned a lot from that. Good. Well, um, I suggest then we um, th th keep the questions coming. I, my, my suggestion is that we try to group them a little bit thematically to start with uh, uh, a couple of broad questions about privacy, imputation methods, the hidden Markov methods, uh, and then move to questions about the states. And then to move on to the agenda that Ewan has set about the, um, the broader interpretation of these data, a potential target journal, and the longer term use of the data. So do keep your questions coming, but that's how I suggest maybe we, we group them. So the first question that's foundational is about privacy. It comes from Kevin. Uh, perhaps I'll ask Kevin to state his question. Yeah, hi. thank you very much. Um, amazing talk. It's really great to see these things working now. And. Um, I know that you commented on that on the long term, but I just wanted to comment more than ask that I, I think it's really important to you know push for these data sets becoming available and kind of figuring yeah. out how to um, yeah how to make all these privacy issues work in uh, yeah. in practice. I think that's really. I, I, I think so. I, I think we need to be very realistic about this as well because we need to do this kind of hand in hand with our ethics community and actually our patient community as well. So, but, uh, so, so, you know, we shouldn't, you know, there's, there are more stakeholders than the, the than the researchers um, and clinicians involved in this. Um, and uh, for me, it's pretty clear that I think the thing that we can responsibly um, push towards 
is kind of a safe haven idea. So the data is anonymized, but also by having a safe haven, having it in a cloud somewhere with some kind of access rules, we can absolutely kind of guarantee to people that we've got audit trails and, and stuff like that for people who can play. But then the people who come in and play have have a lot more, you know, they have a cloud uh, kind of environment uh, for that. So that for me is there's a convergence of these things. My instinct is we'll, we will have to have a consent process for that kind of data sharing uh, and not this routine data access. Because uh, I, I don't see a way of, 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 of doing that without a consent process, but we should, that's why I think it's so important to start that broader consent discussion um, uh, for this. So just for people to understand, because the Epic data set is a routinely collected data set, um, and because we pose questions about healthcare delivery, we were allowed to access this in a fully anonymized way on the, on the basis that we were improving, aiming to improve healthcare outcomes. So that's, that's the kind of the basis that we get to access this data. Uh, uh, and I think that shifting to a consent basis where, uh, will, be, will be important for um, broader use because we have to stay within our boundaries uh, of of the of the description of the of of our, our access rules. Thank you very much. I, I suggest we move on to an, a, a, a trio of questions or a couple of questions about imputation. Uh, Stephen Captoge and Will Astle and, and possibly Angela Wood may have some questions about imputation. Although I don't know if she was able to join during the. She's still on. Yeah. Yeah. Stephen? Uh, yeah, I was, I was just wondering whether the availability of blood tests can be taken as exchangeable between people who have the blood test taken or not, because th that might depend on the disease state. So, th I mean, as I mentioned in, in that imputation thing, for sure the missingness has information, which is kind of, for the data scientists, it's slightly irritating that it's not random because we know we know that the missingness is um is being triggered by decisions and therefore must be correlated with some of the variables uh here um and there's two viewpoints here so one is how valid is our imputation and we're doing some quite careful work to try and check that the results in the states are not overly biased towards particular imputation so none of the hidden markov model states have a have a tremendous strong habit of wanting to only predict the imputed values. I think this goes importantly, not only to the imputation, but the normalization as well. So normalizing is incredibly important and where, where you do imputation relative to normalization is really interesting here. Um, and then, like I said, you can take the, you can kind of take the inverse of this problem and say there's information in the missingness. Can we present that missingness as yet another variable to, 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 to use? We haven't done that. I think there's not so much in there. Um, I think the actual values are <laughs> much more important. Um, uh, so we haven't, we've been mainly it's reassuring ourselves that we're not being driven by imputation artifacts. Um, but your, valid, your point is valid and I, I can well foresee much angst with reviewer three on this topic. So <laughs> I will try and um, uh, protect us as much as possible. Uh, and what do you think is your positive control that gives you that confidence that this isn't being driven uh, largely by imputation? Arguments? So, so mainly that the when we look at the assignment of hidden Markov model states to patient values, we don't see that there is a particular state that has a has a high proportion of imputed values. There is a complex. It's not a flat surface because definitely some of the ICD-10 code, and I think the hepatic state is one of them. Very clearly, the clinicians are ordering a particular battery of tests for a particular set of people. So we will have to have a section on that. So that is a case where one of our states, which are associated with a particular disease code, is associated in this case with a lack of imputation because the clinicians are ordering those tests more often in that scenario. So that's our major thing. 
Um, I'm not sure if there's another way of, of reassuring people, re reassuring Reviewer 3, because I can sense Reviewer 3 on this uh, already. Um, we'll ask Phil, uh, are you Reviewer 3? Uh, do you have comments about imputation? Uh, just a very similar question to Stephen's, really. Um, so I know that, I think you mentioned you were using two different imputation strategies. Yeah. One which was matching um, based on, I guess, all the variables. And then you have this linear interpolation method, which I yeah. assume just looks at the one, one variable on its own. So it's, um, to, it's trying to fit, basically, it's trying to fill in line days so that we don't have to have a hidden Markov model. I mean, we could have pushed that problem into the modeling rather than the imputation. But in my experience, it, if you can impute, it's, it's often cleaner to impute. And then you can, then you at least know what's going on. <laughs> uh, when you push it into the modeling system, then the modeling is effectively imputing. So, so we have effectively missing days and we, we have some criteria for the number of missing days. By the way, this is why we need so much input data at the start, because by the time we filter down to all of this, one can get very thin numbers if you're not careful. So that's why we need to start with 65,000. We end up with 11,000 at the end of the day, uh, unique patients. Thanks. So I, Final quick question from um, Stephen Burgess on imputation before we move to another topic. Yes, yeah, so it, it wasn't a question, but in terms of how the data will be available, um, yeah, I, I guess it would be tempting to try to impute the data, but just be aware that the imputation model and the imputation strategy will depend on how you're going to analyze the data. Um, so just in terms of making the data available, yeah, you'd want to make sure that... Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a whole interesting, and that's why this is all that making the data available is definitely long term. So we've got this whole, uh, you know, safe haven ethics, how we navigate that space, we might have to do this from the ground up. Um, but you're absolutely right, Stephen, that, that if we make data available, we need to make the distinction between the original measurement and the imputed and, and any normalized measurement and any imputed measurement. Um, so that so that people can kind of go back and forth up that, that stream to their heart's content. Thank you. So we have a couple of related questions on the hidden Markov uh, methods. Uh, from Mike uh, Pitzner and Sam Lambert. So, Mike? Thank you um, for this nice talk. So, I was just wondering, as far as I understand from like studying mathematics years ago, how the Markov models can be used to like interpolate between states and even calculate uh, transition probabilities, which would actually refer to political decisions being made. So, have you thought this might be a possible application of your models? So I think that's definitely something to explore. My experience here is, um, so it's really important to realize that the hidden Markov model here is a, is a modeling approach to the data. I, I'll be honest, I will not, I don't trust the transition matrix that much because these things tend to be driven really by the state assignment of the real, you know, the real trajectory of the patient. In other words, if you if you pushed around all the transition probabilities in the hidden Markov model, you're very likely to still end up with the same Batobi path. It's just that the that the um, that the model will go. Oh, I don't quite like this as much. So, so in a data-rich scenario, you tend to be driven by the data. Um, however, I do think there are there may well be things of interest in the transition matrix, which we should look into, but I don't. I caution against assuming that the hidden Markov model is a good representation of the clinical process. I don't believe that's the case. The hidden Markov model is a good representation of the states that are going on in the patients, but we should not over, over endow the model with more knowledge than, than I think it, it, it has. That's clearly a helpful statement. <laughs> So I think uh, Sam Lambert's question was the same or very similar. Luan Luan Sun has a question. Oh, it's a little. Stay. Or it's Sam, a little. Can you come in? Uh, can I ask my question? Um, it's a little different. I was wondering, Ian, if you had looked at maybe if any interventions are driving the straight yeah. state. Yeah. 
So that's, that's for me, I would love to, I, I actually kind of want to be a little bit disciplined and almost not open that Pandora's box until we've, you know, at least got the preprint out and we've joined battle with Revere 3 and everything else. Because I think those questions are valid and, and some of those questions go to, you know, are valid to ask of this data set. Um, but, um, but almost are in the second phase for me um, because there we've got to persuade, you know, there, there, it's, it's, it's obviously not going to be a clinical trial. We, we, they, they, all of that kind of question about interventions um, uh, in an observational data set bring in a whole bunch, a host of other, other queries and questions. So I'd quite like to separate out a very clean data modeling kind of paper and and convincing you know ourselves yourselves readers that that this works and then say in the discussion you know we think we could do some of these exciting things but be aware this is a an observational data set where this thought process takes you i think is into a, a much more long-term kind of viewpoint which is how do you think about randomization or clinical trial interventions or, or other things which may be full-blown clinical trials, but may actually be lighter than full-blown clinical trials uh, using these kind of techniques. I think that's a very fruitful area to, to imagine um, uh, as well, because again, just to stress, the, this is an observational model and therefore, therefore interventions are going to be driven by observations and, and, and you know, good, good clinical practice and therefore trying to work out causality from that, that observation is just going to be extremely hairy. On the theme of modeling assumptions, uh, questions come through from Matt Hurls. Uh, Matt. Yeah, so hi, Ewan. I was, um, I was wondering about the Markovian kind of nature of the model that you've, you've gone and, and is that kind of clinically plausible given the kind of nature of the states that you think you're seeing? Yeah. So again, I think this goes back to not trying to over endow the model with too much kind of wisdom or, or power. Um, and it also goes to the fact that I'm, I'm totally open for other models. I think the thing that the Markovian model does give us is some time state modeling. You know, it's the simplest way of getting some time model in there, which basically says, you know, very likely yesterday was like today. So please kind of make sure your model can capture that concept. And those will be the self transition loops in the, in the hidden Markov model. I, I don't want to claim that the hidden Markov model is a good representation of the clinical process or of the biological process here. And that is slightly similar to not over interpreting the transition states, the transition matrix. What I think is stronger is that it is an appropriate way of assigning states to days. Am I making sense, Matt? Um, and so I'm kind of open to, to other ways of doing it, um, uh, whilst noting that I think this assignment of states to days has been a, a, at least informative, let's put it that way. It's useful. It's in the category of models that I would put into the phrase useful. I think we'll move on to a final couple of questions, Luan Wonsan, about prediction or observation. Thanks. So I, I was just wondering uh, that the presented lens of a state in the slide are actually predicted from the model or the actual values. They're the actual values. So again, we're, we're using the hidden Markov model to kind of label days that are real days with real patients. Um, we're not using the, the hidden Markov model. I mean, obviously the model has, we could ask what the stable distribution of, of things, and we don't have a, an end state, by the way, it would run forever. <laughs> Just keep on looping. Um, okay. So, uh, <laughs> um, uh, so, um, uh, so there's no, uh, no meaningful length of stay in the model. Okay, the thank you. Markovian states. Rudolf Cardinal's question uh, is about the definition of states. Rudolf. Thank you very much. It's a great talk. I was just wondering, um, so some of the states that you uh, infer there, one might think are 
represent obvious clinical states like the renal failure ones and the hepatic injury ones. But then you have those subtler ones like your state seven where there's sort of maybe a little bit of inflammation or you suggested it was thrombotic. Um, but it, I think you said it didn't correlate with diagnosis. So I wonder what your gold standard would be in saying this is a sort of thrombotic state. I mean, would it be correlation with drug prescription or something else? So um, we did have another state that was that I did label as acute thrombotic state. I mean, it is all a bit arbitrary and I'm a bit worried about sort of over-interpreting as yeah. Ian was saying that the, the state. So it's a kind of a, an exercise to go through to see how confident I could be in some of them. Um, but the sort of acute thrombotic state was where the hematocrit was quite high. And you tend to see that um, when people come into hospital as an emergency rather than as elective admissions. There are sort of two main reasons that tip people into needing to seek urgent care. One is they've got some kind of infection that's decompensating a chronic condition or leading to direct illness consequences from the infection that they need to come in now. And the other is obviously acute thrombotic events like a PE, stroke, heart attack. You can't wait and have something elective. You have to come in. And that's what you were sort of seeing in that acute presentation state with both of those sort of things kind of represented. At least that's how I interpreted what I was seeing. Um, obviously recognising that there was, it was a bit arbitrary. And I think with the acute thrombotic state, um, it was mostly just the hematocrit that was up. And there was some quite, there was a few more signals in um, some of the circulatory system codes. Um, but it is, it is all sort of a bit with a pinch of salt. And yeah. there were some states that I was quite confident on, some states that I just had to give a name because it looked like it was to do with something that we were doing, like treatment response state one and two. There were differences, but I didn't really understand why they were different. But, but they sort of, I don't understand why, is also quite interesting. Because if I understood everything, then we wouldn't be uncovering any layers that we didn't already know. So it's nice to see things that are recognisable, for me, I sort of think, okay, this is clustering it in a sort of biological explainable way. Yeah. Um, but also things that I don't recognise, I can go, well, that's interesting. Let's have a look a bit more at that. What, what can we learn from that? So that's how I've taken it thus far. Thanks. Maybe I'll take the prerogative for the final question and ask Rudolf Cardinal. Rudolf, do you have any advice for you and, and team for the journal, Target Journal? Oh, um, not... Uh, I'm not sure I really uh, would have uh, great advice. I mean, so we have similar problems um, trying to uh, go around sort of informatics type journals and clinical journals. And um, uh, it, sometimes these feel like they between two fences a little bit or two, between two stables. And um, maybe the, this sort of work is, you, I guess you have to decide whether you, you want it to be bringing new techniques with a clinically interested audience. Um, so from data science to clinical or uh, within the data science area on its own right. But there's a lot here that's very interesting clinically. So, so maybe a clinical journal. Yeah, I mean, we as the data scientists here will be saying there's absolutely no way that a paper that uses hidden Markov models is going to go anywhere at all. You know, this is this is 1960s. Let's detect Russian subs technology from the 1960s. There's some, there's some journals, like I think it's Nature Digital Medicine, and there's there's a few, but they are quite niche. But then using routinely collected healthcare data in this way has only really taken off since 2016. So um, like the, in a, certainly in hospital electronic records, so the, I think the journals have kind of sprung up fairly recently yeah. from my scout around anyway. Nature Digital Medicine does sound... I think there was that's something right, like that. Like great. <laughs> great. <laughs> might try that. <laughs> and there's a similar journal in the Lancet stable you might want to consider. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, look, um, uh, a record audience, uh, com a complete sellout uh, crowd. Uh, Ewan and uh, Victoria and Maria, colleagues, have given us a window into the future, the convergence of team science, biology, uh, health records, uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I, I'm sure uh, there'll be folk who have further thoughts uh, who will get back to you personally. Um, also to say that I'm filling in today for our normal convener for the HDR UK seminar series, Praveen Surindran, and Praveen and team will be in touch with you about the next one in the series. So uh, till later, thank you very much. Thank you.